So this is, this is Kupka, he's seven months old, and uh, he's my muse now. He helps keep me inspired. <laughs> okay, go on. My current exhibition at the CSUN Art Galleries consists of three bodies of work, most of which was created during the period of COVID. The main body of work are the large-scale drawings that I've been making for some time now, what's known as automatic drawing. I first learned about automatism when I was a grad student at Harvard, and I went to New York to study the New York School, and had the pleasure of actually interviewing some of the artists from that era, such as Lee Krasner and Robert Motherwell, the widow of William Baziotis, and the surrealist Gordon Onslow Ford. What I learned from them really influenced my own practice, but I didn't start drawing seriously until the early 2000s, at which time I held the position of Curator of Visual Arts at the Contemporary Arts Center in New Orleans. Most of the drawing that I was doing was while I was on vacation in Amsterdam where I would draw in the cafes. But then I showed my drawings to some New Orleans artists and one of them, Blake Boyd, went out and bought me a sketchbook with better paper than I was working on. So I realized at that point I had to get serious. Mind you, I had a full-time job basically directing the exhibitions program at the CAC, which was, from a creative standpoint, a wonderful art form in its own. My, my curatorial work I considered to be an art form as well. But I didn't take myself seriously as an artist until that point. In fact, the sketchbook that Boyd bought me is this one. And this drawing is one of the first ones that I made in 2001. And as it happened, it was the night before 9-11. And at first I couldn't figure out why I made such an ominous drawing. And then the next morning the towers fell. And the drawing was created without any subject matter in mind, just drawing quickly, spontaneously, rapidly. Gordon Onslow Ford, the surrealist I mentioned, he restricted his vocabulary to lines, circles, and dots because he felt those were the fastest forms that you can make, the most purely automatic. I hadn't reached that point in my own vocabulary as yet. On the um, Sunday following 9-11, Again, without really thinking about what I was drawing, I came up with this image, which was, to me, a variation on Edvard Munch's The Scream, so I wrote no words. It was just a, a gut response to what had happened. During that period, I was curating an exhibition with the great painter, the late Al Held, and I showed him my drawings, and he was actually quite impressed, and he gave me the encouragement I needed. So I've continued my drawing practice ever since then. In the current exhibition, the large-scale drawings use a stylistic vocabulary that also developed gradually over time while I was in New Orleans, where I use these beaded images that resemble Mardi Gras beads. In part of my research for one of the exhibitions I was doing, I discovered that Mardi Gras beads were left at grave sites to ward off evil spirits, and I like that idea. And so in my drawings, I draw very spontaneous. I just start somewhere on the page drawing my little circles. I did a show in San Antonio a few years ago that I called embroidering the space-time continuum because I felt like that's what I was doing. I was sort of stitching virtually through space, creating these beaded forms and interweaving them, interlacing them. And I draw two-dimensionally flat on the surface but then I end up with a three-dimensional image. I also turn the paper while I'm working. I work quickly, listening to music. I certainly want them to be uplifting. In the recent work, I've also started using these little rays, kind of like what Keith Haring called radiant lines when he did his radiant baby image, where I draw these quick little lines around some of the beads, not all of them. But taken together, they represent my concept of the universe, as well as my concept of divinity. Also, Claire Falkenstein, the late sculptor who used to live in Venice, and I used to visit her studio, and she always talked about her concept of the universe as being a never-ending screen, which I like to call the matrix, for lack of a better term. Gordon Onslow Ford's imagery also represented this idea of an all-over infinite expansive space. And then when I was working with Al Held, he was creating these very large abstract paintings using geometry that also were very expansive. He used the phrase non-gravitational, multi-directional space to refer to the space in those. Held was uh, very interested in string theory at the time, and so his geometric abstractions were conceived 
from a scientific point of view, intuitively, mind you, but he was interested in science and not spirituality, although you can't deny the fact that they sometimes feel very spiritual, depending upon the viewer's perspective. So over time, I've discovered which pens really work for me. My favorite are the Stabilo pens, which actually I used to buy them in a, in a little art store in Amsterdam, but you can get them online from Blick or anyplace else. And then also for purple, for some reason, I really love what I get with the Deco Color pen. It's, its fluidity is just terrific. And then as far as the paper, I work with primarily with two types of paper. paper. This is um, Bristol Vellum, which is a, a fairly smooth surface, surface. And I love the fact that it just, everything moves very quickly. There's a, a nice feel of the pen moving quickly when I'm working over it. The other paper that I love is this paper, which is a thicker paper, it's watercolor paper. And the great benefit to this paper is that the ink saturates it more. So sometimes I feel like I get a more lush image with the watercolor paper and a kind of faster image with the Bristol vellum. Another influence on my vocabulary, which I only recognized around the time I did the embroidering the space-time continuum show, was the influence of my late mother, Ruth Rubin, who was an expert needle worker. And when I was a senior in college at UCLA, an undergraduate at UCLA, my mom hired me to be her artist in residence at her needlepoint store that she opened in Tarzana. She had me designing a mesh canvas which is basically modular. So in a sense, I was designing things that would then be embroidered or stitched module by module. I live here in my apartment with a lot of my mother's needle-pointed pillows and her knitted afghans, all of which I would sit at home and watch her work and she would work close at hand, module by module. And I realized ultimately I do the same thing. I work with my art on my lap. The largest scale that I've worked at is 19 by 24 inches. I don't think I would want to work any larger than that because there's an intimacy both in the creation of my work and hopefully what you feel when you look at it. I specifically requested the West Gallery at CSUN because it is a small, intimate space. My work needs to be viewed up close, obviously, because of the intimate scale and the intimacy of the imagery. The series of drawings that I currently have on view, I've titled them Pearls of Wisdom because to me, they represent these little gems of knowledge that we acquire as we go through life. I'm interested in the fact that we instinctually want to learn and know more. In fact, in writing a, a statement about this exhibition, I came up with the thought that we are given the tree of life at birth, but we have to build the tree of knowledge from the ground up. And in my work, I feel like I'm building little trees of knowledge. Earlier on in the series, I called them either Crown or Tree of Life Arbol de la Vida. I was watching the Netflix series The Crown at the time and I was intrigued by the fact that Queen Elizabeth's role had a lot to do with spirituality and divinity and I had never considered that. And also the very gem-like aesthetic I use seemed to me to be very crown-like, so I, I was using that for a while. I lived in San Antonio for ten and a half years before moving back to LA in 2017 and there's a big Tree of Life, our Bol de la Vida influence there. That was in my consciousness, but it was really over time that I realized that these are more about the beauty of knowledge. I think knowledge is one of the most amazing things that we can acquire. One of the reasons I work exclusively in drawing, first of all, I love to draw. I've been drawing my whole life, and when I was in high school, I used to always be drawing in the back of my notebooks while listening to the teacher. There are two artists in particular who were role models for me in terms of demonstrating that drawing could be an art in its own right, that it could have the power of a painting or a sculpture or whatever. And the first of those, of course, is the late Martha Alf, whose drawings of uh, mostly pears but other fruits and vegetables are just phenomenal. I first encountered her work when I was a young professor at the Claremont Colleges back in the late 70s, and I saw a show of hers at the old New Space Gallery, and I was blown away because I didn't know that people could draw this way in the 1970s. I had seen a lot of old master drawing uh, while I was a graduate student at Harvard University, and I felt that Alf's drawings, which are distinguished by diagonal hatching, stroke by stroke, which she did freehand very evenly, 
or just an amazing feat. And of course, she became well recognized for those works. When I was working in San Francisco in the mid 80s, where I was curator at the San Francisco Art Institute, I had the great pleasure of working with the late Jay DeFeo, who's best known for her gigantic painting that weighs a ton, The Rose, but her drawings are absolutely exquisite. And one of the things that I really took away from looking at DeFeo's drawings is the way, for example, she would do images of, of a camera tripod, but she would only do part of it with a lot of negative space around it so that it looked like it was sort of on the cusp between materiality and spirituality. Also in our exhibition, we had her um, early drawing, The Eyes, which shows human eyes with these vertical lines intersecting them. To me, represents being in touch with greater consciousness, being in touch with the cosmos in a sense. One of the reasons I use a lot of what is sometimes called negative space in my drawings is because I like them to be on the cusp. I like them to be, they could be either be coming into form or disintegrating in that middle zone, which also has special significance for me because I was born at six months, I lost a fraternal male twin, and so coming into the world early somehow made me feel like I'm super connected to the ephemeral zones because I came in before I was technically fully formed. The date drawings, which I do every day now, uh, actually began as something that I would do during my holidays in Amsterdam. I would sit in a cafe and I would make a little drawing of the actual date of the day that it was. I was, of course, influenced by the late, great An Kawara, who was known for his date paintings, which he made every day, and he would, uh, like a Zen exercise. I come out of more of a Judeo-Christian tradition, so mine tend to be more jubilant and less meditative. But it is a meditation in any case. I consider them to be daily blessings. And so I used to do them when I was on vacation, and then of course I would come back and return to my full-time job as a curator and uh, would put them away. So what happened a few years ago is I went to Amsterdam for what was going to be another vacation there, and I got sick to my stomach. And when I got there, it was 80 plus degree heat. The hotel room had no air conditioning, and I decided to just go back home because I couldn't bear it. And once I got home, I felt that I'd, like I'd gone through a black hole. And I suddenly realized, well, instead of doing the date drawings just when I'm away, now that I'm in my sort of semi-retirement phase, I'm no longer working full-time at an institution, at a museum, or a contemporary art space. So why don't I just do them every day, the way Ankawara did? And so it led to the practice that I've been doing for the last couple of years, where every day I make a date drawing, First, I just started photographing them and posting them on Instagram to document them. And then, all of a sudden, I realized that I had my clock sitting next to me, which also had numbers, and I've always had an interest in numbers. And so I started moving that into the photographic, basically into the photographs that I would post on Instagram. Then, I noticed I had the blood pressure monitor, which I use every morning to take my blood pressure. So what happened is they evolved into these photographic tableaus where I have three types of numbers in them. I have the hand-drawn numbers, the analog numbers on the clock, and the digital numbers on the blood pressure monitor. So in addition to showing several of the date drawings uh, journals in chronological sequence, each journal open to a single page in the exhibition, I've printed up six of the photographic tableau. And I also have to recognize the late Martha Alf as an influence. In the last year of her life, she was living in assisted living where she would make tableau arrangements and photograph them and post them on Instagram. So as mine evolved, I eventually realized that I was, of course, paying homage to my dear friend Martha in my own form of photographic tableau. And as long as I can keep going with it, I will continue to make them.